Okay, everybody, welcome. So uh, thanks for coming out on another cold winter's night, okay, for Science Unwrapped. Okay. By way of introduction, my name's Greg Podgorski. I am Associate Dean in the College of Science, but more important for this, I chair the Science Unwrapped Committee, which is a real privilege. And I wanna thank committee members for putting together all these talks and the talks we've had for many years in the past, and it's, it's a lot of work and it's, it's much appreciated. I also wanna thank USU Media Productions who has helped us out, especially in these pandemic times, but at all other times as well to make live streaming and recording these talks possible. And I wanna thank our volunteers who have been really busy in creating online learning activities as we've been through the pandemic. And I'm a scientist looking for wood, knock on wood, maybe, <laughs> maybe just starting to transition out, uh, hopefully without any new variants coming up. <laughs> Related to online science activities, I have an announcement to make, and that is for our March and April talks, we would like to go and have some limited in-person after talk science activities. So we're gonna be ramping those back up starting at the March talk uh, pandemic conditions allowed. So for us, that, that's a big deal. And for the kids that typically are here for Science Unwrapped, that's a big deal too. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, one other announcement is Rock and Fossil Day. All right, so that's an in-person science activity and that is put on by the Geosciences Club in the Geoscience Department. And for those of you, I'm trying to think if I'm geographically challenged, it's one of the buildings <laughs> on the quad out, out that way. Two buildings over, and uh, that's a really fun day. So that's tomorrow, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., Rock and Fossil Day. Okay. Let me introduce our speaker tonight, and this is Dr. Sarah Freeman of the USU Biology Department. We have been lucky to have Sarah in the biology department since 2009, if my memory mm -hmm. seems, like I say, time is funny, because <laughs> some ways it seems like you've been here so long, but 2019 is not that long ago. Yeah. Uh, in other cases, uh, a long time seems just like yesterday, but, but <laughs> it's been great having Sarah here. Sarah is a neuroendocrinologist <laughs> and a word that she will define later, right? But that's, uh, that's, that's your discipline. Uh, Sarah is a native of Atlanta. Sarah's just told me she's a multi-generational Atlantan. Uh, Sarah got her bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Virginia at Charlottesville, a PhD back in Atlanta at Emory University, then Sarah went on to do a postdoc at the University of California, Davis. And that postdoc, yeah, was spent both in Davis and Alaska. And I asked Sarah about that. And Sarah's talk tonight, too, and I should have said this, but I think you all know this because you're here, is the science of social bonds from animals to autism. A subtitle might be the science of romance and love. <laughs> And the Alaskan part actually has something to do with that, right? And that is Sarah's now husband who was over in the back with Sarah's new baby, Bennett, right? There was an Alaska connection there too. And Sarah spent a, a few years in Alaska traveling back between uh, Davis and, and Anchorage. Um, Sarah, a few things about Sarah too. Is Sarah is, is a real star in the biology department. And uh, she has been just incredibly active in involving undergraduates in her research. And she has been uh, recognized, I don't know if it's an honor, but to me it's a big honor, right? With the uh, you know, College of Science Undergraduate mm -hmm. Mentor of the Year Award. So very well deserved. And you'll see the number of students that Sarah has involved in her research. And it's, it's really impressive. A few, uh, few personal things. Sarah is a self-declared <laughs> foodie. Okay, she, uh, she loves to cook. And most recently, uh, Sarah says she's had an obsession with making sourdough bread from scratch, <laughs> all right? So Sarah's also a swimmer, so a lifelong swimmer, at least since about five years mm -hmm. old. And uh, I know of most recently, but a notable accomplishment was uh, swimming across Bear Lake in a Bear Lake Monster Relay team uh, event. I'm not sure it's a race or an event, but but across the lake, uh, and at seven months pregnant, 
and, and <laughs> Bennett is still there, seems perfectly healthy and fine. So, so without me taking up any more time, let me turn things over to Sarah. I think you're really going to enjoy her talk. So the science of social bonds from animals to autism. So, Thanks, Sarah, Greg. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg, for that introduction. It's wonderful to be here on this side of the auditorium. I have been in the audience before, and I've also, pre-COVID, uh, run a couple of the booths for the um, interactive activities afterwards. So it's, uh, I'm a big fan of Science Unwrapped, and it's a real uh, thrill to be here on this side. So um, as uh, Greg mentioned, I'm here to talk about the science of social bonds, or the sort of neurobiology of love, if you will. And my research that um, I'm going to talk about tonight and that I'm also going to talk about as sort of a representative of the scientific community um, s sort of circles around the idea of um, how do we form romantic attachments? How and why neurochemically do we fall in love? Do we form a bond with another individual? So tonight I'm going to talk about what we can learn about the human brain from studying social animals. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an outline of the talk. Um, first, we're going to define monogamy and what that means sort of in human cultures, as well as what that means for biologists who study animal behavior. I'm going to talk about prairie voles and introduce the hormone oxytocin. I'm then going to talk about how we study the brain and where oxytocin acts in the brain. And then I'm going to talk about how we can translate our knowledge from animals into human health and how what we know about the neurobiology of social behavior from animals has informed our knowledge of autism. And then I'm going to end with just a few minutes on some new research happening here in Cache Valley that I've initiated as a new faculty member studying coyotes. OK, so we could study human romantic attachments by um, asking individuals to come into a laboratory, say, volunteer for a psychology research study and talk about their dating histories or, um, you know, go put them through questionnaires or whatnot. Um, but there's a lot of limits, both sort of ethically and experimentally, to studying human romantic attachment um, because you can't really control <laughs> who you fall in love with. We can't force someone to fall in love with somebody else. And we also ethically, of course, can't... Um, you know, make somebody break up with someone. So if we want to really understand the science of attachment, it's a lot easier to turn to the animal kingdom and to study animals that are capable of forming long-term attachment relationships just like we can. And those would be species that have a monogamous mating system, such as the ones shown here. Um, birds, like the swans and penguins on the screen, about 90% of bird species have some form of monogamy. Um, we'll talk about the different forms of monogamy in a second. Um, but it's pretty rare in mammals, um, and we'll talk about that too. Um, some animals' examples that are shown here are gibbons um, that are uh, lesser apes that form attachments, uh, beavers, wolves, um, as well as prairie voles, which I'll talk um, about in a bit. So what is monogamy? We, as humans in our human culture, have an idea of monogamy. Um, you don't cheat on your boyfriend or girlfriend. That's generally what we think of when we define monogamy. It's kind of a um, one partner at a time kind of a de an idea. Um, and that's generally the, the definition as well. An, a relationship or a mating system in which an individual has only one partner. Um, and that could be during their whole lifetime. Or it could be what's called serial monogamy, which is what humans are generally considered to be. Um, although there's some variation across different societies around the world and different cultures and different um, communities um, all over. But generally speaking, we are serial monogamous. That means if you think about a series, like your favorite TV series, there's episodes. So we've got maybe your high school sweetheart, and then maybe you date somebody, a couple, maybe a couple different people throughout your college, if you end up going to college, and then you might marry someone. Some people get divorced and get remarried. And so we have a series of monogamous relationships throughout our lifetime, and that's called serial monogamy. Sexual monogamy is when you add that sexual fidelity definition, that sort of um, loyalty rule to the, to the mix. Um, this is extremely rare in the animal kingdom. Um, we take it kind of for granted, I think, in a lot of uh, you know, human culture um, that the sort of nature of the relationship is that there are no physical interactions or intimate interactions with anybody else except your uh, romantic partner. 
But in the animal kingdom, that's very rare, and it takes a lot of hours of observation on behalf of scientists to determine if a species is sexually monogamous. You have to show that individuals and pairs across seasons, across years, across populations, always, always mate with their partner and don't ever mate with somebody else. And that's very rare and very difficult to define as a biologist. If that's true, and you can then take DNA from the offspring and do paternity testing, then you have what's called genetic monogamy, where you can show using science, using DNA evidence, that only the offspring are coming from those two individuals in that mated monogamous pair. And that is one of the rarest mating systems that we can find in the animal kingdom. So if monogamy is so rare and we want to study monogamous animals, what, what's out there that we can study? So the most common form and the sort of version of monogamy that we use in the um, science world is called social monogamy. This is where um, two individuals will defend a shared territory, so they sort of cohabitate, they live in the same area, um, and they engage in behavior that is indicative of a social pair. So what does that mean? First, um, they spend extended time in close proximity. Um, so that means they're together all the time. They are often found nearby one another, maybe co-sleeping or huddling or grooming one another. Um, in humans, you might see them holding hands walking around. Um, you might follow each other around. You go to events together. So you spend a lot of time together. Animals do that too when they're in a social pair. They show distress when they're separated from one another. Um, you guys might be able to relate to that if you're sort of involuntarily separated for a long time from your attachment partner. Um, it doesn't feel very good. Um, and the only way that that stress can be alleviated um, is by the return of that one social mate and not another individual. So we can also study that in the lab by separating and reuniting animals and looking at how they, their behavior and hormones uh, change as a result of that. As I mentioned, they uh, defend a shared territory, but they also share resources. They share food. Um, they, they may you know, just tolerate um, food theft. There's a lot of different ways that you can um, define sort of sharing resources in the animal kingdom. And then another unique feature of monogamous species is that both parents contribute to infant care. So in human societies, we might take fathering behavior for granted, um, but in a lot of animal and mammalian um, species, there, there really is no fathering. Uh, the fathers aren't really part of the picture. Mothers raise a litter. The litters weaned and grow up and go off and do their thing. Um, but in monogamous species, there are both, um, both parents contribute to the infant care. Partners also buffer each other against stress. So if you are in a new environment or if you are exposed to something scary, um, if you have your partner with you, you are less afraid of that new environment. You show less of a stress response. You can kind of think of this like maybe someone's afraid to fly. Um, if you get on a plane by yourself, you might have a much more of a stress response than if you were flying with your pair mate with you to help you kind of buffer that stress and get through that scary situation. And all of this taken together is called an attachment relationship. And these are things that we can measure in humans and things that we can measure in animals. Um, and what I've been interested in studying um, is this one species called the prairie vole. These are not prairie voles. Everybody um, gets confused. Uh, most people get confused. These are prairie dogs. We are talking about prairie voles. They are small, um, sort of shrew-like rodents that live in um, the cornfields and, and uh, crops of the Midwest, kind of up into Canada as well. And they live in burrows, and they eat the root systems of all of the cash crops that um, kind of run the farming industry of the Midwest. And so they've actually been considered to be um, pests for decades. Nobody in um, the sort of farming world is happy when they've got prairie voles that are eating the root systems of their crops in their fields. And so back in the 70s, some researchers in the uh, sort of farming and agricultural world decided that they were gonna try to study them to figure out how better to get rid of them. How can they trap them more effectively or poison them or eradicate them or get rid of them from their farms? And they set out traps and this one researcher, Lowell Getz, who is now sort of the um, you know, great grandfather, if you will, of the prairie vole um, research community, 
noticed that he was always trapping a male and a female in the cage at the same time together. And so he did what's called a mark and recapture study where you can put a, a collar or a little you know, dye mark or some sort of indication that that individual um, is you know, maybe purple or has a certain tag on it or whatever you might be, and then you release them back into the uh, wild and see if you can trap them again. And so he did that with a number of different prairieville uh, pairs and kept trapping the same male and female pair over and over and over again. And so he was the first one that, to suggest that prairie voles, uh, a rodent that we would think is probably not monogamous, um, shows this monogamous pair bonding behavior. And then from there, they became the sort of new laboratory rodent for the study of social bonds and social neuroscience and social hormones. And so you might think of them as sort of like a lab rat or a lab mouse, but instead it's a prairie vole. And so there's now dozens and dozens of labs all over the country and all over the world that are studying them for their ability to form these attachment bonds, for their fathering behavior, um, and for their development. Um, and so it's been pretty wonderful. I, I trained in my graduate school in a lab that studied prairie voles, although at the time I was working in monkey brain tissue, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so what, what have we learned? What, has, what have prairie voles taught us, both the scientific community um, and the, the wider um, community in general, uh, what have they taught us about the biology of, of monogamy, of social attachment? Well, primarily, they told us that oxytocin is very important. How many of you have heard of oxytocin? Oh, I love this. <laughs> There's very many, very many of you. And virtually, for those that are watching um, on AggieCast, I'm sure there's probably quite a few of you that have heard of it as well. Um, it's in the news quite a lot around this time of year. Um, it's like the love hormone is its nickname, and it comes up in the news a lot around Valentine's Day. Um, but some of you might know it because you are a mother, or you know a mother that's very dear to you who might have had oxytocin um, administered when she was going into labor um, or to help her through the process of delivery. It is actually sort of traditionally and, and most commonly known as this uh, female childbirth hormone that's released that initiates the uterus to start contracting to initiate labor. It's also really important for the milk letdown reflex that happens in the mammary glands that allows um, a breastfeeding mother to nurture that breastfeeding baby. And as a longtime oxytocin researcher, um, as, as Greg mentioned, I have recently gone through this myself. <laughs> um, exactly four months ago, um, I gave birth to Bennett, um, who's here in the corner um, hanging out. And uh, it's, it's a, just a total trip to be sort of on the, on the personal side of this as well as the sort of science side. I'm sure my um, medical team was tired of hearing me talk about the science of oxytocin after all of my doctor's appointments and things. Um, so oxytocin is produced by a part of your brain called the hypothalamus. Um, if you think about the sort of exact center of your head in all axes, that's where your hypothalamus is. It's right in the middle. And it is the only part of your body that synthesizes oxytocin and releases it into the bloodstream to act on all of the different targets, including the uterus, the mammary glands. Um, but it also can then act in the brain, at parts of the brain, where there are receptors for that hormone. So I'm not going to go into too much of a sort of a textbook here, but there's a little sort of textbook cartoon where the um, hormone, so we can pretend like this is oxytocin, it has its action by binding to a receptor that is sort of married structurally to that hormone. And what it does is um, it will bind. Let's see if I can get my pointer back. It will bind, and then it changes the function of the cell. You don't have to worry too much about any of this. Just suffice it to say that cell, that neuron, whatever it is, um, is then altered in its function and can then change, you know, maybe downstream change behavior, for example. So you can study oxytocin. You could measure oxytocin in the bloodstream. You could give oxytocin and see if it changes behavior. Um, but what I'm really interested in is the receptor side. Are the receptors, are the sites of action of that hormone different in animals that are monogamous or not monogamous um, or, or any other sort of research question you could dream up that might have oxytocin system um, underlying that um, hypothesis? So 
how do we actually study brain tissue if we want to find out where oxytocin is acting in the brain? Well, you take a brain out of an animal. Um, generally speaking, if you are working with animals like monkeys or coyotes, which I'll talk about later, um, this, it, this work is done what's called opportunistically. So if given the opportunity to take a brain, you can take a brain. So if an animal dies of natural causes, or if a veterinarian decides that that animal needs to be put to sleep, um, researchers have the opportunity to make something sort of productive out of something that would otherwise be considered sort of sad, and we can take out the brain, and that animal can contribute to our understanding of um, social science. So you take the brain, you slice it on this fancy machine called a cryostat, um, which my undergrads in my lab are um, very well versed with. <laughs> we have two of them, and they are always being used to section brain tissue into these super, super, super thin sections that are about as thin as a human hair. And then we mount them to a microscope slide, and we just go through and cut the, through the brain, mount all of the sections, and then you can take that microscope slide and put it through a procedure in the laboratory where you soak it in different types of solutions or expose it to different types of chemicals, and you can then find out where the receptors are in the tissue. And so the mechanism, the sort of method that we use to do that um, is called receptor autoradiography. You don't have to worry about all the details, but what it does um, is it makes the oxytocin receptors in that tissue um, sort of tagged and marked, and then we can view them as these black areas on that cross-section of brain tissue that we had on the microscope slide. So the way this works, if you think about these sort of cartoon, now very simplified cartoon receptors sitting in a cell surface, um, we can take those, those receptors that are in the tissue sections on those microscope slides and expose them to this radioactive version of oxytocin. So a ligand is another name for the molecule that binds to the receptor you care about. And so if we have a biotech company make a special version of oxytocin for us that has a radioactive atom in there that's constantly emitting energy, then we can track everywhere that that radio ligand binds. And when it emits that radioactive energy, we can then put radioactive, radiosensitive film down and it turns that film black everywhere that, where the receptors are located. So it's kind of like an X-ray film where you're, the, it changes color based on where the image is being generated. So in this film, it turns black wherever the, that radio ligand has bound to a receptor. So we then have this nice um, distribution of oxytocin receptors in this black and white image of the cross section of the brain. This one specifically comes from a prairie vole. And what some researchers did a few gosh, maybe decades ago now, um, is compare this brain slice, this sort of oxytocin receptor distribution, the pattern of binding in the brain, to the brain of a meadow vole. So this is in the same group of organisms. They live in the same part of the country. Um, they have lots of similar um, non-social behaviors. They burrow, they eat the same things, but they don't form a social bond after they mate. So they don't have that unique capacity to form an attachment relationship after they mate. And what's interesting is that this part of their brain, labeled nucleus accumbens, NACC, um, is devoid of oxytocin receptors in the meadow vole, but this area is full of oxytocin receptors in the prairie vole. And some of you who may have a background in um, neuroscience, some undergrads in the audience might know what the nucleus accumbens does, but I wouldn't expect that. This is actually an area of the brain that's in the reward pathway. So this is part of your brain that's activated by things that you love, that make you feel good. And so um, you can think of like your favorite food might activate that part of the brain. Um, drugs of abuse, recreational drugs, often hijack the reward circuitry of our brain and act in the nucleus accumbens, and that's what underlies a lot of um, addiction. And so what the researchers that discovered this um, explain is that oxytocin is acting in this reward area of the brain in these socially bonded species, but not in the species that are incapable of forming these bonds, and it's um, underlying that sort of social wanting and social liking that's, uh, that's mediating that attachment relationship in the prairie bowl. So we can measure the pair bond strength or the sort of um, preference that the animal has for their pair mate by putting them in a laboratory test called the partner preference test. 
Um, this was developed in the 90s and has been used across many labs. And what you do is you start with um, the test subject. So this is the animal that you're, you're measuring what they're doing. And you put their pair mate, their partner, on one side. And then you put an animal over here that they've never met before that's the same general size, the same sex, same age as their pair mate. And then you just see what they do. And you measure what they're doing. You, you count how many minutes they spend. And you can also say, what's the quality of that interaction? <laughs> um, they don't really like the stranger very much. <laughs> they know that that's not an animal that they want to spend time with. And they go find their pair mate. And they snuggle up and groom each other and yawn and maybe take a nap. Um, so we can use this laboratory test to measure the, uh, the sort of preference that that pair bonded vole has for its pair mate. So question for you all. If you could go in and selectively block the oxytocin receptors in that reward area of the brain, what do you think would happen in that partner preference test? Yeah. Yeah, they would stop reacting like a bonded pair. No longer have that reaction in their brain to be like, hey, this is someone I want to be with. Yeah, so if they, if, if they don't have that reaction in their brain of this is who I want to be with, then they would maybe spend more time with the stranger or wouldn't show that preference in the partner preference test. Yeah, so, you, so we can do that, and that's exactly what happens. Um, you can actually do these um, surgeries where you can go in and selectively um, put a drug that blocks those receptors, um, stitch them back up, and then put them into the test, and they will not show that partner preference where they want to go snuggle with their pair mate, which is pretty fascinating. But these are little rodents, right? They're pretty distantly related to humans. I, we have lots of similarities, but what about animals that are more similar to humans than rodents? What, what animals would you want to study if you were studying more closely related species than rodents? Chimp chimpanzees, I think I heard apes, bonobos. bonobos. What's the large class of animals? Primates, primates. yeah. Monkeys, primates, yeah. Um, ape research is, is no longer supported in the United States um, in any sort of captive sense. Um, but monkeys are often used for research um, still. And there are three species that are commonly used for social research. Um, the common marmoset, the coppery tt monkey, and the rhesus macaque. The um, marmoset and the tt monkey are both capable of forming uh, social bonds, social pairs. Uh, marmosets have a, a slightly more flexible mating system than tt monkeys. Tt monkeys are classically very strictly monogamous. They form attachment bonds. They actually twine their tails together um, in like a little twist when they sit together on the branches, which is pretty cute. Um, rhesus macaques do not. Uh, they don't form social bonds between male and females after mating. Um, they have very strong um, uh, mother-driven sort of mat matriarchal groups um, and lots of very strong uh, mother-infant bonds, but they don't form that male-female bond. So they're kind of an interesting um, comparison group to the TD monkeys and the marmosets to ask similar questions like we did in the prairie vole and meadow vole. So what I did in my dissertation during graduate school was to find out whether oxytocin receptors are in the reward areas of pair bonding monkeys. And the answer is mostly yes, or if not oxytocin receptors, uh, receptors for oxytocin's sort of sister hormone vasopressin. Um, and so this is a section um, sort of cut down the middle of a marmoset brain where you can see the oxytocin receptor density in the nucleus accumbens. TT monkeys, um, this section got sort of um, flattened at the top, but this is the middle and this is the half of the brain. Um, they don't have oxytocin receptors, but they do have vasopressin receptors in that area. And rhesus macaques have neither. So there's no oxytocin receptors and there's no vasopressin receptors. So some evidence that there's some similarities to the sort of vole story happening in the primate world as well. But what I was really interested in is not necessarily driven by um, you know, what, what's going on um, that might distinguish these groups by their social organization, but also what, what do all primates have in common about their oxytocin receptors? What parts of the brain just in primates in general 
express oxytocin receptors because that's what's going to tell us about what's most likely to be happening in the human brain. So if there's something that all primates have and humans are primates, then maybe we can make some assumptions about what's going on in the human brain. So what I found across um, all these different monkeys, if you kind of map them onto this sort of cartoon version of the sort of a side view of the brain, is that all of the regions that have oxytocin receptors in primates overlap really strongly with the areas of the brain that we know to be important in visual attention and visual processing in the primate brain. And if we compare this to what we know about the rodent brain, um, oh yeah, and what, so if you were to compare this to uh, what we know about rodents and how they navigate their social environments, what sensory, what of the five senses do you think the oxytocin receptors would be enriched in uh, the rodent brain? Smell, yeah. So the fancy word for that is olfaction, the olfactory system. And if you look at the um, distribution of oxytocin receptors in the rodent brain, you can see this huge area right here. This is the olfactory bulb. This is the part of the brain that gets all of the input straight from the nose, and it is full of oxytocin receptors. And so it seems like, over evolutionary time, that these two distinct groups of animals have had the oxytocin receptors enriched in these pathways of the brain that are important for the sense that they use to navigate their social environment. So primarily vision for, for primates and primarily olfaction for rodents. And so this got me thinking and, and apparently got quite a lot of other researchers thinking that oxytocin is probably pretty important in what we pay attention to as, as humans, as primates, and many papers started coming out after I published this saying, oxytocin changes attention in monkeys, in people, in children. Um, it has this huge change in what we pay attention to um, in these sort of laboratory tests of um, social interest. And this got a lot of individuals thinking that maybe if oxytocin is capable of sort of augmenting what we pay attention to, then maybe it could be a therapy to try to um, improve the social symptoms of individuals with autism. So autism is defined um, in a, a, by a few core symptoms. One of them is um, deficits in social communication and social interaction. Um, they tend to have um, differences in their ability to navigate sort of social um, situations. And so, if you um, study the way that they pay attention to faces and sort of social scenes, um, the researchers, not me, um, other folks in the community have found that they have what's called a limited attentional bias for faces. That means that um, not individuals that, are, that don't have autism like to pay attention to faces. If you show them faces and other things, they'll pay, they'll, what they want to look at faces. Um, they just naturally have this bias to pay attention to faces. But individuals with autism have what's called a limited attentional bias, so they don't necessarily pay as, as much attention to faces um, as individuals um, that don't. These are in toddlers. Uh, similarly, they don't have this preferential looking at the eyes. So this is an eye tracking study where you can actually track using a special sort of computer technology uh, what individuals are looking at when you show them a screen. And what this shows is that individuals that uh, don't have autism spend a lot of time looking at the eye region of a human face. And individuals with autism look at the mouth, so this like the moving part of a face or a moving part of a, um, uh, of a movie. Um, or they kind of avoid the face and trail away from it. So what do you think would happen if you gave these individuals oxytocin? So, so you, yeah, it might like help them or it might make them more like the unaffected individuals. Um, yeah, it actually restores that attentional bias to faces. It, 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 they pay more attention to faces when they've been treated with oxytocin than um, individuals that didn't have that treatment. So this is great, right? Not, not everybody in the autism community wants treatment or needs treatment, and there are um, lots of beautiful and wonderful things about the individuals in the neurodivergent community, but for those who do want some sort of help, 
to try to get them to be able to navigate social, social environments um, more smoothly. Maybe their parents want to help them. This is really good news. This is something, this is a natural hormone system of the body. It's not a synthetic drug. Um, there are no FDA approved drugs to target the social symptoms of autism. So this was a really big deal and a lot of folks in the clinical world are actively researching oxytocin to make sure that there are no side effects, that it's safe, that it's effective, um, especially when you're using this in kids who are still developing. But we don't know anything about the oxytocin receptors of the human brain, right? So this is where my research comes in. So what I really wanted to find out is where the oxytocin receptors are in the human brain and whether or not they might be different in the brains of individuals who had autism when they were alive. Because if there is a difference on the receptor side, it doesn't matter how much oxytocin you give them, it's not going to help anything because the receptors are the ones that are different, right? So we need to be looking at the receptor side of the story as well while all of these wonderful clinical researchers are trying to help figure out the, the oxytocin side and the treatment side. So what I did was I applied to the government's brain bank. Um, the National Institutes of Health has a... Um, multiple um, locations all over the country where they receive donations from individuals who want to donate their brains or other tissues to science after they die. And that catalog of brain tissue includes a number of individuals who had autism while they were alive, um, including another, and as well as a num number of individuals who were what we would call unaffected typical, un, you know, typically developing, um, I don't like using the word normal, but um, otherwise without any sort of neurological or psychiatric diagnoses. So um, those brain tissues are just as important because we need to have something to compare the um, what we sort of clinical samples to. So I applied and I was awarded uh, 44, I think, um, brain specimens, not whole brains, but little pieces. Um, and the piece that I got was from this area here. This is the um, basal forebrain. This is a part of the brain where there is both a reward area, the ventral pallidum, as well as a really important part of the brain that controls uh, sustained visual attention. So like when you're really concentrating and paying attention on something, um, that's the part of the brain that helps you do that. Um, so what we, what we found is that typically developing individuals have much greater oxytocin receptors in that reward area compared to individuals that had autism. Um, in autism, it was uh, significantly less um, receptors for autism in that reward area. And in that visual attention area, the individuals with autism actually had m way more oxytocin receptors. And so it is speculative at best to say that these are um, driving the symptoms or functionally um, causing the symptoms of autism, but um, it's certainly possible that this might underlie the sort of maybe reduced experience of social reward that they might feel from social interactions or a reduced sort of motivation to want to engage in a, you know, go to a big party and socialize with lots of people. Um, and it's possible that this pink area outlined that's the sort of visual attention area um, having more oxytocin receptors there sensitizes that area to the action of oxytocin. And so it's possible that this might underlie the sort of self-reported um, uh, being overwhelmed by things like eye contact or um, hugging or um, parties. And so where I'm hoping, since um, this is the first, as far as I know, um, the first evidence of a dysregulation in the oxytocin system in autism, um, I'm hoping that this will inform future research, um, and my lab is also following up on this as well. If you just look at that reward area, that ventral pallidum, um, and you break out the oxytocin receptors by age, so we had a distribution of ages um, in the sample, so from less than a year old all the way up to um, mid-20s. Um, the solid line up top is typically developing individuals. Um, this is the amount of oxytocin receptors they had in that reward area. And the um, dotted line below them is individuals with autism. So overall, you can see the, what I just said, that they're lower in individuals with autism. But what's interesting is this peak at age uh, two to five. So this is a pretty important critical period in human development 
where the individuals are learning how to talk and walk and engaging in side-by-side -side play and really kind of becoming little mini humans. You know, they're no longer infants anymore. They're, they're toddlers and they're interacting with their social world. And it seems like, um, at least from the data we have, that this huge peak where this reward area is highly sensitive to oxytocin um, may be driving that critical window where they start to engage in all these social experiences and that that window is maybe delayed or shifted or sort of dampened in the um, samples that we got from, um, it, from the autism community. So um, some food for thought. We need to follow up on it. We have um, a, a limited number of samples to make this conclusion on. We always want to increase um, the number of specimens that we're studying. Um, but of course, this is very hard work that's relying on um, donations. <laughs> Um, and I always feel um, that it's very much an honor to have the, the um, ability to do this work um, based on the, the sort of generosity of the individuals that donated their tissues after they died. Uh, we're also following up on this with some genetic work, um, which I don't have results for yet, but I'm pretty excited to try to see if there's any genetic um, sort of underlying uh, genetic variation that might be driving these changes we see in the brain. So I have told you about the sort of biology of human social bonds and social behavior. Um, but what I really want to tell you about at the end here is what we are studying here in Cache Valley um, about another organism, the coyote, um, as a representative of the canid community and what we can learn about monogamy in canids. So canids are dog-like species. You can kind of think of the same word canine, like wolves, foxes, coyotes, dogs. Um, as I mentioned before, monogamy is pretty rare in mammals. Um, only about three to nine percent of mammals exhibit monogamy. That goes up a bit to like 20 percent in primates, um, only about 16 percent of carnivores. So really, the, the minority of species are uh, considered to be monogamous. But in canids, all species that have been studied to date exhibit monogamy, at least in some environments. Um, so this is the, the rule, not the exception to the rule. This is how it works in the, in the canid um, world. And I love this quote from a publication that came out. Um, in no other mammalian family is the pair bond so ubiquitous. Ubiquitous means everywhere. So why not study a canid instead of a prairie vole or a monkey where they're sort of the, the outlier. Like, let's go to a family where the pair bond is the norm. So luckily, um, I landed here at Utah State where there is just um, south of us a USDA facility in Millville that has about 100 captive coyotes that are housed in big outdoor enclosures in monogamous pairs. Um, and this work would not have been possible without a big collaborative effort from um, two individuals, uh, Drs. Julie Young and Eric Giese in the College of Natural uh, Resources. Yeah, I was say Natural Science and Natural Resources. Um, they have been huge um, in helping me uh, establish this research program. The facility's general mission is to understand and manage human predator conflict. So those of you who might have grown up around here might have experience working in farms or ranches where coyotes are um, very disliked and considered to be pests that might have um, you know, killed the neighbor's cat or taken the baby lamb or done something else that makes them um, sort of hated in the um, general community. But they have a lot more similarities to us than we give them credit for. And what I've been um, trying to do is use them as a sort of a new model organism to understand how much of this oxytocin story can we generalize to other monogamous animals, or is it really just happening in prairie voles? Like, is this something that all monogamous animals have? So the way I've been doing that is through um, this uh, sort of integrative, multi-pronged approach, which I'm going to teach you a new science word today, uh, behavioral neuroendocrinology. So let's break that down. Behavioral should be self-explanatory. We're studying animal behavior. How are, how are they behaving? How do they um, interact with their mate? How do they behave in, in a partner preference test? Um, neuro means brain, so we can take their brains when given the opportunity and study the receptor distributions and try to find out how the um, brains of coyotes um, um, 
signal oxytocin and vasopressin. And then uh, endocrinology is just a fancy sort of medical term for hormones. So how do we measure and manipulate the hormone levels of these animals? We are also doing some genetics work, which is very difficult because the coyote genome has not been sequenced. So we're having to do a lot of things um, kind of old school in-house, which is both exciting and challenging. Um, but what I'm gonna leave you with today is some videos of these animals in the partner preference test that we've designed. So using the fences and enclosures that are already there in the uh, predator research center, I was able to situate um, this sort of three-chambered arena, so, kind of like the video I showed you of the prairie vole, where we have a stranger on one side, um, the test subject, so this is who we're measuring the behavior of, um, and then the partner on the other. And we can swap, you know, which side the partner's on and, um, you know, make sure that our research is uh, balanced in that way. And then we can just measure what fence line, what, how, which side of that neutral center enclosure do they want to spend time with? Do they want to spend time near their partner or do they want to spend time near the, the unfamiliar individual? So this is what it looks like. Um, the partner, so the, the animal, um, the stimulus animal is here. And then this is the test subject. And you can see them tracking each other along this fence line. Um, and really, they know who's on the other side of that fence. Like they're one of, I think this animal rears up and tries to climb the fence at one point. Um, you know, really eager to try to bridge that gap, to try to maintain that close physical distance between mates that I talked about earlier. Um, we can also, which is gonna, I'm gonna have to take my microphone. Um, we can also look at um, their vocalization behavior. So in this video, you're gonna see um, the test subject is over on the right side. These are kind of two panels of videos that are yoked together that are, um, so you might see this individual move across the fence line over here for a second. Um, and what you're gonna see and hear is their um, duetting behavior. This is their sort of defending a shared territory um, kind of behavior that they do. Hopefully this will. So pretty, pretty neat to have the opportunity um, to study these, uh, these unique animals. And I have to say the, the staff at the, at the facility has just been wonderful. They, for decades, have been um, using practices that maintain wild behavior. So they, they limit human contact. They have them um, chasing prey items. Like they'll put food on a little remote control thing to get them to chase. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been really wonderful working out there. Um, and I'm hoping that I have more uh, stories to share in my future career um, looking at their behavior. So to end, um, what sensory areas of the coyote brain do you think contain oxytocin receptors? Do you think they're gonna be more like the primate in the visual parts of the brain or more like the rodent in the olfactory parts of the brain or a combination or something else? Anybody have any guesses? I saw someone point to a nose. Anybody else think nose? Anybody think vision? I see more hands for nose, and you're right. Um, from our initial investigations, um, which I'm working on, um, all, all of this has been done by undergraduate students. Um, we're, we're mostly seeing them enriched in the olfactory parts of the brain. Um, so that's, it's pretty exciting. I would have maybe thought we might see some in like vision and the um, audition, you know, because they, they howl the way that I just showed you, but um, it's, it's fascinating either way. So with that, I will end, um, and I just have to acknowledge all the folks in my lab that have helped me do this work. Um, all of the individuals in the bottom three rows are undergraduate students that are working for me, and it's just been a delight to have them. I've got a postdoc um, um, up here in the corner, Lexi, who's in the audience, um, several graduate students, Caroline, who I see here too, um, and I, I just wouldn't be here without them. So um, thank you so much for giving me an ear, and uh, I hope you all learned something, and I am absolutely happy to take any questions that you might have.
for our audience at home, to my apologies, uh, please submit your questions via Aggie Chat. And when you do, be a little bit patient until you see the message that uh, wait until the moderator has joined the chat to make sure your question gets submitted. So questions for Dr. Freeman. I think I'm going to go with you first and then we'll come over. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, um, when we took the brain slices, how do we see which areas are darker or lighter? So the way that we do that, um, you, you, just, you take the brain slice, and then you kind of hover the microscope slide, and it just mounts and sticks up onto the glass. And then when you've done enough animals, and you've got enough of those slides for an experiment, you can run them through this technique where you occupy the oxytocin receptors that are present with a, a molecule that is um, emitting radiation. And then when you put that tissue up against a film that is sensitive to that radiation, the film turns black. So then you can take the film and then go in and measure how dark the area is. Um, we, can, we standardize it and everything. So you can actually measure the differences between regions. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Two part question. Yeah, okay. two part question, go for it, yeah. We all know one canid that seems to Domestic dog. Oh, and I meant to say that. Yeah, domestic dogs, have, you have bred monogamy out of them. So the second part of my question is, does that support the hypothesis then that this is a genetic, genetic So the question is, um, does the fact that we have bred um, monogamy out of dogs support an idea that there's a genetic basis for it? Um, it's a good question. I like where your brain's at. Um, you know, I think that whatever changes we have done to the dog genome, <laughs> um, there may still be something there that allows them to form a bond to us. So um, I've actually gotten um, approvals through the vet school um, and uh, USU legal department to receive donated postmortem dog tissue from individuals in Cache Valley who want to donate their um, pet after they are euthanized. So if an individual would like their their dog to live on for years and years in science. Um, I have the ability to accept dog brain tissue now. Um, I only have one, um, but I'm hoping to be able to study dog brains and maybe dog genetics um, to ask or to answer that exact question. Like, what is the mechanism that allows dogs to form bonds to us? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so those cases spread much across that way. How did, did you guys also analyze which species showed more of them spread? Um, yeah, so the question is, um, in, the in the brain tissue from human donors, we saw a difference in the, um, between individuals who had autism and individuals who did not. And the question is, are there other species where we see something similar? Um, and at this point, um, what's actually very interesting about the primate brain is that across marmosets and TD monkeys and rhesus macaques, there's actually not a lot of oxytocin receptor density anywhere. There's just, it's very, very limited in its expression. Um, and so the areas that we do see receptors are those areas where I showed you that are overlapping in the visual area. So we haven't had quite enough, um, uh, like, individual samples from all of those species to be able to do like major group differences. Like we only get three, four, five brains from each animal. So we can sort of characterize the system, but we don't have the, what you would call statistical power <laughs> to do, you know, very strict comparisons. Like in the human study, we had, I think, 22 per group, um, which is a number of, of specimens that we can actually mathematically measure the differences between them. Um, so the other work in other species has mostly just been um, what we would call like a characterization study. So yeah, good question. Yeah, I see one up here. Um, can, other get autism? can other animals get autism? That is such a good question. I get that question a lot. Um, generally, no, we don't believe that animals can get autism. Um, but what we can study about animals that can help us understand autism 
is if we can figure out what's going on that allows them to behave in a what we would call species typical way. So, you know, the way that most individuals of that species would behave, um, then we can find out what's responsible for that sort of typical behavior, and then we can go study those systems in individuals with autism to find out if those systems are um, different in individuals with autism. So, yeah, it would be really convenient if there were animals that had autism so that we could study them as well, but we, um, we don't seem to have that. Yeah? Since autism is a spectrum, do we also see in the brain the receptors or the responses to oxytocin being those for them? Yeah, that's a great question. The question is, since autism is a spectrum and we have uh, differences in um, you know, the sort of severity or the, um, you know, expression of the symptoms of, of autism, do we also see variation in the oxytocin receptors? Um, I wish I could answer that question. We don't, so I guess I could in a way. We don't have for every donor the sort of severity of their autism. We just know that they had a diagnosis of autism. In the 22 specimens, I think, 23 that I have, nine of them were uh, given with the results of their diagnostic questionnaire. So I actually do have numbers for how severe their social deficits, how severe is their repetitive behavior, um, how severe was their uh, like verbal communication capacity. Um, and I, with only nine, is a, is a very limited number to try to draw conclusions, but I did attempt to do correlations to see if the amount of oxytocin receptors um, sort of predicted or vice versa the severity of their autism, and we just didn't have enough statistical, mathematical power to be able to conclude anything, but um, hopefully future studies with larger sample sizes might be able to get at that question. It's a very, very good question. How are we on time, and should we do Zoom question, or uh, Aggie cast questions? Yeah, what's your Aggie cast question? None have come in yet. None have come in yet. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, you are here. So across primates and canids and rodents, does the structure of the autism receptors stay consistent? Does it converge? It's the same. Yeah. So the question was, does the structure of the oxytocin receptor change um, across different species? And there are minor changes, um, but generally speaking, it is highly conserved because it's also very important in uh, reproduction, right? Because it's, it's also expressed in the uterus. So you'd think that something involved in... Um, uh, you know, childbirth would be highly conserved across mammals. <laughs> Great question, though. Um, other, I've seen a few I've other got hands. One, Sarah, that just, yeah. Uh, you got oh, one? I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. yeah. So, a question, just as I said, no questions have come in. We have a good question from Aggie Cast. So, do people with autism tend to produce less oxytocin, or is the difference with their oxytocin receptors? Yeah, that's another great question. There has been, um, gosh, dozen, maybe 20 studies now, um, specifically looking to measure oxytocin in the bloodstream of individuals who, had aut who have autism. So they've, you know, enrolled in studies, they have had um, their, even sometimes their spinal fluid um, taken, and there it is, all, it's all over the map. There's a collection of studies that say that individuals with autism have lower oxytocin, and then there's some studies that say there's no difference. Um, so, you know, Science is trying to figure that out, and so far there's been inconsistencies in the results. Thank you. Yeah. I saw several more hands. How about up here? So have we seen similar, I think it's called, I guess it's better question, have there been other studies done on other behavioral disorders? For example, like ADHD, I think you said that they, it's very connected to focus and focus on yeah, that's a great question. So have there been studies looking at oxytocin receptors in the brains of individuals with other types of psychiatric diagnoses, like maybe ADHD, um, if oxytocin is in these areas that are important for attention? Um, as far as I know, I'm the only person who has the method to do that, and I am actively working with students to <laughs> answer those kinds of questions. So um, we have a graduate student in the lab from the neuroscience program who is doing that, that same sort of research idea in schizophrenia. So um, small pieces of targeted regions that are implicated in 
um, schizophrenia symptomology, we're now looking to see if oxytocin receptors are different. But that we could, that's a great idea. I mean, we could apply to the brain bank and get tissue that was donated from people who had ADHD and try to answer that question um, with study. So yeah, good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where do I see my research going? Oh, man. Um, I love using a comparative approach. So that means studying lots of different species. Um, I think that there's power in learning about differences and similarities. And so if we can study different species of monkeys, different species of canids, dogs and coyotes, as well as humans and humans with clinical conditions and do um, a lot of different research in sort of a, a wider swath, I think we can really narrow in on what is sort of the, the true generalizable sort of core of, of the social brain. Um, that's very different from some folks who are like, I'm gonna take this one thing and go really molecular with it and go really deep dive into the mechanisms. Um, I have a few things that I think we could do that with, but um, generally speaking, I would love to get like beaver brain tissue or <laughs> like other types of species to really characterize these systems in the brain. Um, at this point, there aren't a lot of folks out there doing this work. Um, some people are working in um, marmosets and other types of rodents. Uh, not that marmosets are rodents, but marmosets and then other types of rodents um, that have variability in their social behavior. Um, and I'd like to kind of contribute to that overall umbrella um, but yeah, I would, and I, I don't know, I also really love working with coyotes and I hope that that project grows legs, if you will. <laughs> yeah, up front. So something that I had seen previously from a documentary is basically, you know, they inject um, a person with a trace and then they can um, use an MRI to see like mm -hmm. word react. Is that something that could be done with this? This is such a good question. So um, the question is, um, from watching a documentary, um, there, she has learned about a method where uh, humans can be injected with um, what's called a tracer um, that can go into the brain, and then you can do neuroimaging. So in like an MRI or a, um, uh, uh, yeah, neuroimaging um, uh, equipment, you can then look and see what's happening in the brain of living individuals. And um, yes, you can do that in a lot of other systems. So um, there are molecules out there that will fit the bill. Um, but when I was in graduate school, I was actually part of a team that tried to make that molecule, that drug, that tracer that you could inject in a vein and it would go into the brain and then light up oxytocin receptors in a brain scanner. And we failed <laughs> after like six years of working with chemists and radiologists and um, veterinarians and uh, in rats and in monkeys. Uh, we, I think, published five different publications trying to figure that out and we never got one working. So um, I think there is a pharmaceutical company in France that's now trying to figure that out. But it's a really good question. Um, that would allow us to do a lot more <laughs> and not have to always rely on the sort of post-mortem donation of brain tissue. So um, yeah, good thought. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna keep going until you tell me to stop, Greg. Okay, we'll, we'll go another another four four minutes, okay. four or five. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. So I was thinking about your first slide where you were showing the Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the question is, what advantage would it have, kind of looking back at the Meadowvole, Prairie Vole story, what advantage would it have um, to have the oxytocin receptors in that reward area or not? Um, and it's a really good question. What is the sort of adaptive value of having a pair bond or having the ability to form that pair bond? Um, and it's a question that's actually maybe better answered like in a, more, in a broader sense. Um, if you are a species, and you're living in an area where there's a lot of predators around, then if you leave your babies in the nest to go forage to bring food back, your babies could get eaten. And so if there's two parents there, then the babies are more likely to survive and pass on the genes that dictated that they would form a bond, and so then monogamy is sort of evolutionarily conserved. Um, I don't know if that's the case necessarily with meadow voles and prairie voles because they live in the same habitats and have a lot of the same um, 
predation stress, for example, but there's a lot of theories out there about why monogamy is adaptive and in what context. And a lot of it has to do with um, predator uh, rates, food availability. So um, if there's um, a lot of food um, versus not a lot of food, that can change how the mating systems are adapted, um, as well as the population density itself. So if there's just not a lot of other members of your species around, and you find an opposite sex member of your species, sometimes the sort of evolutionary pressure is to form a bond to that individual, raise babies together, and help the you know, species survive, so to speak. So um, the sort of theoretical reasons why monogamy would evolve is a huge and wonderful question that's being answered by um, evolutionary biologists and other folks outside of my discipline. Yeah. Are there other are there other species that show monogamy? Yeah. That aren't mammals. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot. There's actually um, there are a few species of frogs that show monogamy um, that will actually deposit eggs in like little cups of plants and let the tadpoles live in the little pool of water there. And both the the father and the mother frog will um, bring them food, which is pretty neat. Um, there are species of fish that form monogamous bonds. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's rare, but it's not unheard of. Okay. Question from the audience at home. Uh, so what diseases, if any, affect the production of oxytocin? And then moving further, can these diseases modify human behavior or perhaps cause depression? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I... I would have to think. I'm not a clinician. Um, but I would imagine if there's any cancer of the hypothalamus or pituitary gland, um, that would absolutely impact the production of oxytocin. Um, genetic alterations that might um, impact the oxytocin gene itself or the receptor for the gene might impact the system. Um, I don't know of any like named diseases for which the primary symptom is a deficit in oxytocin, mm -hmm. but that's Thank not you. to say there isn't any, but yeah, Thank it's a you. good question. Thank you. It's time for one more, if there is one more. Last one, yeah. Can you tell the size of the cerebral vasopressin and that one subspecies of monkeys? And if there's similarities between oxytocin and vasopressin, could there be another hormone that then affects this neural pathway that causes the cerebral vasopressin? Yeah, so why would we study vasopressin and, and not oxytocin? Um, a lot of people study both. I study both. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and honestly, um, I think that oxytocin just got popular, and vasopressin, for whatever reason, didn't. Um, back in the 80s, vasopressin was um, sort of first in, implicated in territoriality behavior and was sort of thought to be more of like an aggressive molecule, if you will, rather than like the love hormone. And so I think it became this sort of, um, you know, ignored like stepchild, <laughs> so to speak, like the Cinderella story where vasopressin got kind of ignored and oxytocin got all the grant money. Um, um, but um, I study both. I love both. I think they're both very interesting. They're actually capable of binding and activating each other's receptors which complicates this whole story even more. Um, but I can't remember the second half of your question. Could there be another hormone that could then maybe cross that is similar enough to the expression of oxytocin activate the receptors as well? Yeah, is there another hormone that could activate both or could cross talk between them both? Um, not in your body. There's not a hormone that would do that. But there are drugs that are being developed, mostly for research use, to try to target one receptor or the other that don't end up being selective for one or the other, that do activate both. And so um, in the sort of scientific realm, in an animal study, we could use a drug to sort of activate or, de or, or block both of them. Um, but not, there's not anything in your body that is um, uh, you know, mixed in its affinity for both of them. Thank you, everybody. This has been a thrill. I really appreciate all your questions. OK, thanks very much.